Okay, so I'd like to talk to you today about allele-specific methylation. Um, in practice, this means genomic imprinting. Um, so we're interested in looking at regions on the genome where you have a different level of methylation on, say, the maternal chromosome versus the paternal chromosome. This is implicated in um, developmental disorders as well as cancer. Um, and so we are looking into this in a mouse model. Um, Primarily, in order to study this, obviously we need to actually separate which reads came from which chromosome um, and then look at the methylation states on those reads. Um, this practice is called haplotyping, so we separate our reads based on known discriminating SNPs. Um, in our case, these come from the Mouse Genome Project at the Sanger Institute on short read sequencing. Um, unfortunately, nanopore um, error rates are quite high, so it makes the, the haplotyping process a little bit more difficult. Though. Given we know where these SNPs are, we can actually exclude most of the errors simply because they lie in regions that are of little consequence to us. Um, additionally, the 10% of SNPs that do have errors in them can be overcome with long reads. Um, and I'll show you a comparison between short and long reads um, in haplotyping a little bit later um, as to how this really improves our haplotyping. Um, just a little schematic example here. We have a, a SNP in the middle, um, which could either be a C on the paternal chromosome or a T on the maternal. Um, anywhere we, where we see the paternal genotype, we assign that read to the paternal chromosome, um, and same for the maternal. Anything that has an error there, we're calling this filtered. Of course, in practice, we might have 30 or 100 or 300 SNPs, um, so rather than just having one, we'll only filter these if we really can't make a decision. Um, we also use nanopolish, which I think Jared Simpson just gave a talk on, so I won't go into detail on how this works. Um, but it methods has. both for calling haplotypes and also for calling methylation. Um, and this is what we use for our methylation detection as well. A little note on methylation while we're on that. Um, we'd really like to make use of these long reads. So a lot of the sort of standard protocol around methylation detection uses what I'd call cross-sectional methylation, where you look at a single genomic site um, and aggregate all of your reads at this position to make some kind of statement about the methylation there. Um, what we have that we haven't used in this, in this context is what I'd like to call longitudinal methylation, um, where we can really integrate the data along a single read, which we know comes from a single um, DNA strand. Um, and this will be very helpful, in, particularly in terms of visualizing our nanopore methylation data. Um, in practice, we don't use the average, as I showed in that slide. Um, we'll use the lowest fit. And this gives us information within the read as well as between the reads. And you can see, for example, that read in the middle there, which might otherwise confound our analysis when we take an average across sites, um, is clearly an outlier, um, and we don't need to worry too much about it. A little bit about our experiment. We're sequencing, um, uh, a, cross uh, sorry. We're sequencing a hybrid mouse between two outbred strains. Um, so they have a large number of SNPs, which makes the haplotyping process easier. Um, this is embryonic placenta, 14.5 days post-fertilization, and we also have matched reduced representation by sulfite sequencing and RNA-seq. Um, and we have three nanopore flow cells for a coverage of roughly nine times. At the CPG sites, a little bit more detail. This is our nanopore coverage on the CPGs, median of about 11. Um, I mean, a median coverage on the bisulfite is zero because the reduced representation on the RRBS means that it's restricted only to regions on the genome which have um, high CG proportion. Um, and so there are actually a large number of reads, a very large number of reads at zero on that histogram that are not shown. Um, now, the haplotyping process, unfortunately, is a little bit tricky because of the error rate. Um, so what we do is we take two different methods. We have a, a bespoke um, method that we developed using the base calling. We also use nanopolishes, phase reads, um, functionality. And we combine these two decisions um, based on this chart here. It's a little bit complicated, so I do apologize. Um, basically, we need to decide, do we have enough SNPs in the first place to make a decision? For us, that means five SNPs. Anything less is immediately filtered. Um, then secondly, do the, reads, do the two methods agree? If they do agree, great, we're done. If they don't agree, we then go on to say, well, did one of them perhaps filter out more SNPs than the other? Particularly the, the base calling method may have a lot of errors and could make an erroneous call because, say, 50% of SNPs on that read were deletions, for example. Um, and finally, we call, do what's called relative certainty, where if, for example, one method says 95% of the SNPs on this read are maternal, and the other method says 55% of the SNPs on this read are paternal. Um, we'll take the, the read that is closer to 100%, if you like. Um, and that 
in all gives us about two thirds of our reads can be successfully haplotyped using the combination of methods. Here's a quick overview of our nanopore and reduced representation by sulfite um, haplotyping. As you can see, we get roughly equivalent numbers of um, maternal and paternal reads on the nanopore and on the RRBS, um, but a large number of reads in this category I call unassignable, um, which means those reads had zero SNPs and we, we can't proceed any further. We do have a little bit of wiggle room here with the nanopore. About 20% of the reads have been excluded in our, in our filtering process I just described. Um, so assuming we get increases in accuracy over time, we could increase this to roughly 90% of our reads successfully haplotyped in time. Um, this is just the, uh, the same thing for the nanopore data across chromosomes. You can see the, the distribution is reasonably consistent. Also, we get the sex of our, the sex of our sample right, which is <laughs> a nicer uh, little bonus. Um, we have just one X chromosome, which is the maternal, um, as we expected. A little more on combining those two haplotyping methods. Um, these are the hybrid strain and also the pure paternal strain, um, and the two scores we get from our two methods on the X and Y axes. Um, as you can see, there's quite a large number of reads here in the middle where nanopolish gives about 50-50 um, SNPs from maternal and paternal, but the base calling actually gives us a better result. And this is confirmed in the pure paternal strain where we can see these reads really are paternal reads. Uh, my hypothesis there is that it's an um, improvement in base calling beyond the HMM model, uh, which might give Albacore the, uh, the advantage here. Finally, very briefly, um, this is the RRBS and the nanopore methylation. They agree. Um, I won't harp on about that because um, other people have discussed it before me. Um, nanopore does tend to undercall highly methylated regions, um, but it's still the, the binary classification, classification is pretty good. Onto our results, we have um, known imprinted genes within the mouse genome. Um, there are a few dozen of them. Here's one example, impact. We have the nanopore methylation up top. These vertical bars here are the location of CPG sites where we have information. Then we have reduced representation by sulfite, haplotyped RNA-seq, as well as the imprinting control region just located down here. Um, as you can see, you get a beautiful separation between the red reads, which are the maternal, and the blue reads, which are the paternal reads, at that imprinting control region. Each of these, by the way, is a low S fit of the methylation on a particular read. Um, another example, this is my favorite, Nespas and Genus are two imprinted, uh, two imprinted genes right next to each other. And again, you get this beautiful separation between reads, um, both in the nanopore and in the bisulfite. Uh, so it's a nice confirmation that our method is indeed doing what we'd like it to do. Um, in case you thought I was cherry picking, which I was, um, <laughs> these are all of the primary imprinting control regions. Um, as you can see, a couple of them we have too little coverage to make any reasonable statement about, but most of the imprinting control regions show a strong pattern of here the, uh, the maternal imprinting control regions have a strong difference towards the maternal allele and the paternal, the same thing in the opposite direction. Finally, we'd like to go away and say, can we discover new differentially methylated regions or new imprinted genes? Um, so using DSS, we called 32,000 DMRs with a p-value of 0 0.001, and they have in each case for enhancers, promoters, and gene bodies, a substantial enrichment of overlap compared to a, a random distribution of DMRs that we simulated. And while this is a, a limited in terms of the clustering of genomic features, we do think that at least some of these DMRs have genuine biological effect behind them and not just noise. Quick example of two of them. This one's my favorite. We have a, a differentially method methylated region at the TSS of these two long non-coding RNAs. Um, when we zoom out, we see right next to it and I'm not making any biological statement here, but an interesting candidate to explore further, um, a, differentially uh, a differentially expressed read gene, sorry, in our RNA-seq called WNT7A. Um, so we'd like to investigate this one further. Another example here, um, another long non-coding RNA, it's differentially expressed, and we have this weird pattern of methylation at the transcription end site. Um, I can't make any statements again about this biologically, except that we'd like to investigate it further. So I'd say at eight times coverage, nanopore is a, a good investigative tool um, to find out which regions are really of interest to, to look at further. Just next to this gene, by the way, is a known imprinted gene, PDE10A, part of the um, AIR imprinting cluster. And so this is really uh, un unusual and interesting to, to pursue further. So just in summary, uh, we have shown that haplotyping and methylation on nanopore reads can be done on native DNA. It gives us a, a reasonable insight into genomic imprinting at low cost and low coverage um, and agrees both with um, RNA-seq and um, 
bisulfide sequencing. At the moment, we're currently processing the data for the reciprocal cross, so we can show if these um, effects are genuine genomic imprinting or whether they're strain-specific effects. Um, and hopefully we'll go on to look at X inactivation as well. Um, and finally, a big thanks to all the people back in Australia who made this work happen. Um, and thank you to, ne to Nanopore for having me speak. Scott, thanks for the great presentation. Uh, time for a question? Anybody? All right, Scott, well, thank you very much.